Now, 1 Kings is right before 2 Kings, okay? 1 Kings chapter 19. When you get there, say amen. Y'all are there already? I said, when you get there, say amen. amen. Y'all there already? Man, y'all got some fast-moving Bibles. Oh, yeah, you got your phone. Eh? You used it on the phone. Now, it's important today that you take notes. I don't care if you take pictures of the slides or how you're going to do this, but eventually you're going to need what I'm going to share with you. And it may not happen today, but it's going to happen sometime, and you may know somebody else is going to need it. Here's, here's what I found out. Here's what I, the qualifications. What every person has in common that God used mightily. I want you to listen to me. Just, this ain't on the overhead, so just look up at me and listen to me. First, when God uses you, you have to have an emotionally stressful circumstances that become surprisingly complicated. Second, you must have a character flaw that results in a failure. Third, you need to have severely damaged or broken relationships. And finally, you need to have an upheaval of life's routines and comfort zones. These are the criteria for every person I have found in the Bible that God used. It's crazy because we think to ourselves what we've got to have is an easy life and, and uh, you know, things going well and we pray for it to go that. That's not how God uses people. Everybody I've known all through Scripture, they went through this. Relational issues, they had upheavals in, in, their, in what was going on in life. This morning I want to talk to you, and not just to you, but to everyone in this house that may struggle in this area. I am so for the staff that I get to work with. Pastor David and Pastor Joseph, uh, all the, the, the uh, Josiah, uh, the ones I work with daily, and then those that come out and work in the kitchen, and then the volunteers that I see. Uh, Keith Sanders was there several days this week helping us out and aggravating us. Uh, you know, you got to have an agitation. If brother <laughs> doesn't show up, then you're never going to get uh, polished. You know, you got to have brother and sister sandpaper in your life. Can I get an Amen. So there's this ache that goes on in all of us at a certain place in life. And I, I want to talk to you about overcoming burnout. I've heard this phrase so much, I would rather uh, burn out than rust out. I don't want either one of them. I've been burned out one time out of 40 years of ministry, one time, and uh, it cost me dearly. So I go back and I review and I look over life as I'm moving through it. So I want you to take some notes because you're going to be able to help somebody. Psalm, one, Psalm 42 verse 11 says, why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. In other words, David's saying, maybe not today, but later on, I'm going to get my praise on with him. But right now, my, I'm, I'm depressed. I'm down. Uh, I feel this burnt out feeling. So how does it all start? I'm, I'm in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me give you a little bit of review first. There had been no rain for three years. We've gone through a little drought here of just a few weeks, and already the, the grass is not growing, and the, the water's getting sucked up out of our, our lakes and ponds, and you feel it, man. You feel the heat on you. Imagine three years, and already an arid place where there's no rain. And it was Elijah who said, it will not rain for three years. He, he makes the proclamation. Well, this put, and listen, this put a political uh, upheaval in the area the kings didn't know how to deal with it the people didn't know how to deal with it and all they knew was a prophet of God said it will not rain for three years now this caused a lot of repentance in the land but it also caused people to rise up against Elijah he found himself on a place called Mount Carmel Amen. It was a, a, a mountainous place. And there are 450 prophets, uh, wicked, if you would, of Baal. Uh, I could use the word satanic. You could do all kind of stuff in the Old Testament as you see how these people and what they worship. They were led by two people by the name of Ahab and Jezebel. Let me say it again. Jezebel and Ahab because she ran Ahab. Okay? And when they get up on top of the mountain, there's an issue, a, um, a contest that takes place. And the contest was this. You stack the wood. Elijah laid it out. You stack the wood, put a bull on top of it for sacrifice. Amen. And after you do that, the God who answers by fire, let him be God. The Bible says they put the bull, and you'd think to yourself that the bull was the sacrifice. The bull wasn't the sacrifice. There were bulls dying everywhere because of the drought. 
So they put the bull on top of the altar, amen, and the Bible says that the prophets begin to dance. And they danced and they danced around. And a matter of fact, the Scripture says they begin to cut themselves. You know that emotional thing that folk go through today when you start cutting yourself? Amen. So they start cutting themselves and carving on themselves, and, and they're screaming out for their God, the Baal God, to answer. They, he didn't do it. I like Elijah. He's a smart aleck. Now, I, I have a little smart aleck pastor in me. You know, I just have, I'm going to say, matter of fact, I did two videos yesterday. The first one I couldn't put out because it was too explicit. I did a little ventilating while I was on the lawnmower while I was while I was going and I stopped. I actually did it. It was posted. It was it was it was fixed to pop on Facebook and I I deleted it <laughs> because I, I thought to myself ah, that may be a little strong. Amen. You don't know the place you're in, Jerry. So be a little nicer as you share with people your message from the mower. Can I get an amen? So here's Elijah. He yells at him. Hey, I don't think your God can hear you. I think your God is dead. You got a deaf God. You got to shout a little louder. So they shouted a little louder. They cut themselves a little bit more. This went on for a while. Amen. And he's all by himself sitting back. He said, I don't think God's listening. And when it was over with, he said this, bring me six barrels of water. Pour the water on top of the bull. Cut the bull in half first. Great message. Cut the bull. Amen. Then pour the water on top of it. That's the sacrifice. You want to see God move? It's going to be during a time of sacrifice not when things are rocking in your life but when things are lean in your life amen so he pours the water on top of it that you can imagine it, this is this is precious water is life they put the water on it and then he said that the god who's god answer by fire the bible says the fire came down from heaven lapped up the water took out the sacrifice and at that moment the prophets go nuts and elisha goes into this and i know it's violent but he goes into this killing mood, and he takes out 450 prophets, kills them all. Now we're in chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything I just told y'all, everything Ahab, that Elijah had done, and how he had killed the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods yes, deal with me be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. In other words, I'm coming to kill you. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Then he came to Beersheba in Judah. He left his service there while he himself went in a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. Anoint my lips to share, our hearts to hear the experience of all of us in this room. We've had many of us have had these experiences. Help us to walk through this and avoid burnout. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. My God, what a classic example of burnout. After every mountaintop, there's always a valley. This is after camp experience. You have this great camp. Ben, you enjoy it. Cuba, you enjoy it. It's great. It's exciting. It's wonderful. Then camp's over or Monday comes, and all of a sudden you've left the mountaintop and you're back down in the valley. After every high, there's a low. With every success comes stress. You know, you may not need this message today, but you're going to need it eventually. You're going to come through a great victory. Things will be going to be great in your life. You're going to get that financial blessing. And then, boom, Kenny, it hits you. You get healed. Things are wonderful. Then, boom something else happens and you find yourself back in the valley so pastor what are the signs that we need to look to for amen and we see them here first we depreciate our worth we put ourselves down mentally there's a little tape going on in your mind that says over and over i'm a nobody my life doesn't matter it sounds like linda rodstead singing to you you're no good you're no good you're no good baby you're no good I'm going to say it again. You're no good. That's what she did. I'm insignificant. I don't count. I have no value. So it plays over and over in your mind. And then you start doing what you know you're headed for this burnout. In Kings verse 4, it says, Elijah came to the broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed, Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm no better than my daddy or my daddy before him. I'm just like him. And you get into a circle. I'm no better. When you start comparing yourself to your past, where you came from, and, and other people that have had failures in their life, and you look at it, you say, I'm no better than any of them. I got to remind you, look at the great victory. He just saw fire come down from heaven. 
He just took out 450 prophets, but he's hit a place of depression. I've said this for years. I do not believe that life is linear. I believe that it is circular. Amen. I believe that life is up. And then it comes down. I believe there's great highs, and then there's lows. I believe there's paychecks, and I believe there's bills. Amen. Amen. Life does this all the time. So when it comes to a Sunday, I need to be up here because most of y'all are down here. Amen. I want the band and everybody to be up here because most of y'all come in down here so that when we finish this service, y'all going to be up here. But guess what? Mondays are coming. And when it gets here, oftentimes we got to reload, we got to rethink this thing, we got to press on through life. And this is what I see with this man. I've seen it in the life of David, I've seen it in the life of Elijah. He hits a place in life where he is so depressed, he runs and he hides in, in, in a place under a broom tree. He's just trying to find some shade, and then he begins to compare. When you start comparing yourself to somebody else, you're setting yourself up for an emotional burnout. I've said it for years, comparison demoralizes. When you look at a... Mirror, mirror on Facebook, how do I really look? <sighs> Instagram, Instagram, tell me who I really am. When you look into this mirror and you begin to compare yourself with everybody you see in this mirror, shy, it will destroy your emotions. It will affect you when somebody else gets more likes than you. Amen. When somebody else, don't, when you look to see if somebody noticed it and they didn't, and you missed all the hundred people that did notice it, all these things start going on, and then depression will start setting in because you compare. Amen. This could be the worst or the best thing you've ever had in your life. It's just according to how you use it. Can I get an amen? And once you start comparing, the second things you start doing is criticizing yourself. Yeah, you, you are not, you're your own worst critic. You, you, you know, people, I, I get on to me more than anybody else. When I finish preaching between here and the next place, I say, man, you shouldn't have said that, or you should have said this, or you should have helped somebody there, you should have made sure you went and connected with that person there because you know they're struggling, and you'll start beating yourself up. Amen. You tell yourself, I must, I should, I have to, I ought to, I've got to. The second major cause of burnout is trying to control everything. Mm -hmm. Control it. Comparing is number one, but trying to control everything is number two. It's like the Atlas Syndrome. You're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're the, you're the mom. You're the, the matriarch of the house, and you've got to make sure everything runs well and all the kids are doing right and the grandkids, or you're the daddy. You've got to make sure you provide. I have to make sure everything's going to turn out all right. I have to hold everything together. I have to work everything out. If it is to be, it's, it's up to me. I have to make it. Amen. You're setting yourself up for burnout because you can't make everything work out. You can't make everything work to it. I've said this forever. I, I cannot, don't let what you cannot control control you. If I cannot control this situation, I cannot allow it to control me. So, and it's hard to do because you want to try to control it. First Kings 19 verse 5 says, and he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals, and a jar of water. I thank God that Elijah didn't get up and look at the bread and say, you know, uh, that's fattening. There's a time, guys, you got to quit this attitude of I got to eat everything right all the time. Sometimes I need a sandwich. I need a, I need, I need to hit Subway. Uh, potato chips, oh my God, yes. Because what happens in life is you, you, you forget. And so the angel woke him up and said, eat, drink. And then the Bible says Elijah went back to sleep. Amen. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 9 says, there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars. What he said is God church ain't what it used to be. Amen. You see, we had great services. People got saved, filled, amen, baptized. They were excited. They were being discipled. But now they, they forgot your covenant. They're doing whatever they want. They broke down the altars. They put your prophets to death with a sword. And I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. See, the other issue whenever you are going through burnout, is you exaggerate your problem. You exaggerate it. 
I'm the only one. I, I've gone through all of this. You know, at that point, no matter the size of our problem or issue, it's bigger than anyone else's. This is what happened with Elijah. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. Can you hear the pity party? I can. God, I'm the only person in the world who loves and lives for you. Amen. They're trying to kill me. And just a few days earlier, it wasn't but a few days earlier. It wasn't but 40 days ago, he called fire down. 40 days ago, he saw one of the greatest miracles he, that the world has ever witnessed. Amen. As a matter of fact, when he's on, he, he's been, he's the man that, that traveled after the three years of drought. He's the cat that, that went to a place, he laid down by a ravine, and a dirty bird showed up and fed him. A raven showed up and fed him. Then he got up and he went to a woman in a place called Zarephath. And when he got there, he saw her gathering sticks. And he said, ma'am, make me some bread. Amen. She said, bread? We're going to take these sticks. We're going to cook us some bread. Amen. And then we're going to eat it and die. They ain't nothing to eat. The drought has took it. She don't even realize she's talking to the man that started the drought. And he says to her, ma'am, feed me first. Feed me first. Oh, you selfish preacher. Feed me first. And I promise God to take care of you. It was a test. Again, sacrifice. So she takes a little bit of oil she has, a little bit of flour she has. She makes him a biscuit. He eats the biscuit. And he says, now go make your kids some. Why, you just ate everything. Go take, go pour. And she grabbed her vessel, amen, and as she was pouring out the oil, the oil kept pouring. Amen. She filled up this pot. Amen. And then she, then she filled up another pot. And then she just kept filling up pots. It just, and she filled up every pot she could find with oil. Oil is good money. Amen. A miracle, miracle, miracle. This man has seen miracles. He's walked with me many times in your life. You've seen miracles. You've seen God's stuff for you. Debbie Felice, you shouldn't even be here. Miracles. Miracle, miracle, miracle. I have seen it in this house. And if you forget the miracles and where you've come through in life, you're going to head right back to the burnouts. If you forget the financial miracles when things are lean and gas is at $6 a gallon, amen, you're going to say, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it. You will make it. We're going to make it. Can I get an amen? amen? Punch your neighbor. I mean, not, don't punch him. Just touch him and say, hey, we're going to make it. Tell him that. We're going to get through this thing, man. Even now he's so drained, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, he can't even focus on reality. He can't get the picture right. You know, we've all been there. You're so tired. You're so worn out that you can't think straight. Then you're drained, fatigued. You don't seem to see reality as it really is. Then he says on top of that, they're trying to kill me. Amen. They tried to kill me. They sent a messenger saying they're going to kill me. Listen, if I'm ever going to kill you, I ain't going to let you know. I ain't sending a messenger. If, if I ever decided to take my life, God forbid, I ain't going to let you know. Listen to the preacher. Because a lot of folks are just after attention. By the way, no, don't, let's don't do by the way. Let's go to the next one. I get in trouble, so by the ways. The next cause of burnout, emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning. It's when you listen to your feelings rather than the facts. You focus on how you feel rather than on what's reality. That's the truth. Emotional reason goes like this. I feel it, therefore it must be true. Now, you've learned yet that emotions lie to you. That's why people tell me, listen to your heart. No! Don't listen to your heart. Your heart will lie to you over and over and over again. I see it all over social media. Just do what your heart says. Don't do what your heart says. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. That's what the Word said. It's deceitfully wicked. Your heart will get you in trouble. Amen. Do what the Word says. Think about it. Break away from the emotional moment and think for a fact. Again, we're saved by faith. Amen. We say through faith, not feelings. This is huge again right after any camp, revival, experience. Amen. The emotions are going to wear off. Eventually, the feelings are going to be gone. And you're going to be searching for the feelings. And you got to realize then, you're married by faith. You're saved by faith. You're healed by faith. Everything you need in life is by faith. Amen. Even when I'm not feeling it, the, you know, listen, the, the truth is some of us, we came to church today saying, you know, I don't feel God's very close to me. I don't feel close to God. You're wrong. God ain't never left you. Your feelings are lying to you. Jesus did not say, when you know your feelings, your feelings will set you free. He didn't say, he said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Now, first, it's going to make you miserable. 
truth do that. But then it's going to set you free. So the most damaging consequence of all of this, though, is in our loss of vision. We lose vision. When you start to burn out, you forfeit your future. You forget your goals. You basically want to give up. You're so emotionally, physically, spiritually drained, you just want to give up. What happens is you stop caring. You don't care no more. And when you hit that spot, you're in trouble. I just don't care. Yeah, you give a blank is broken. Mm-hmm. See, that stuff I said on the video, I can't show y'all. Mm-hmm. Amen. So notice what Elijah said. He prayed that he might die. That's giving up. I've had enough. I've had enough, he said. You stop caring. This, this happens in relationships all the time. Amen. If you're in a relationship where you constantly have conflict, pretty soon you start draining dry of love and energy. If you keep having conflict with siblings, you keep having conflict with spouses, you keep having conflict with your boss, you keep having conflict with, with people around you, eventually, amen, the love and the energy run out. And some of you may be at that point today. You may be saying, Pastor, I'm ready to check out. I'm, I'm ready to, to get out of this marriage, out of this career, out of this, uh, out of this thing or that thing, out of this church. I'm thinking of just checking out of my whole life. Well, what do you do when you hit that point? Well, what's the answers here? Amen. God told Elijah several things. First off, rest your body. Rest. You notice this body is not, an en is not the uh, energizer bunny. Have you noticed your body's not the energy? It's like, I can go all day. And you wear out. Man, when I was young, I thought I could go all day, Kenny, all night long. All night long. All night. All night. But I could do it, baby. I mean, I could go. I could drive all night. I could drive 24 hours. It wasn't a problem. And then age started coming on me. And I found this wonderful thing about, I don't know what it's like, but man, if I can just get a little nap. Just, just, just wee nap, man. Just, can you just a little bit now? I'll be all right, young. I'll be all right. If I just get, I got to re-energize. I got to get something back. So first thing he did, after he traveled, he laid down. The angel woke him up. And the Bible don't say much about the angel, but, but I'm always curious, did they kind of have conversation? What went on there? What kind of bread was it? You know, what kind of bread do angels make? You know, I'm sure it's banana, banana bread. I'm probably, probably, he probably took some of that manna out of the Old Testament and threw it in there. Amen. But, but he fed him, and he got him some water. He took care of him. Where did the jug come from? All these thoughts run through my mind. The coals, where did he get the fire? Did he use a big? Amen. I just wonder how he got everything rolling. And then he woke him up again, did it again. And then the Bible says he traveled 40 days. Now, listen to me. When you take a walk, sometimes the best thing you can do is just take a walk. There's something about that walk. I walk, I walk quite a bit. And uh, 40 days of walking, 40, 40, 40, 40 all through Scripture. 40 is the start of a new beginning. 40 is how you break addictions and habits, 40, 40 days of fasting, uh, 40 days of, of what Jesus did in the wilderness, the temptations, even 40, 40, 40, 40 years, 40, 40. So he took 40 days to get from one spot to the other. When he got there, God asked him, he said, what are you doing here? Amen. Listen, Psalm 127 says this, verse 2, it's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Have you forgotten how much God loves you? He made you with the need for rest. It's when you're resting and you're dreaming that you're thinking, your mind, you get into that subconscious place in life. Man, I, I, I dreamed the other night. This is crazy. This, is, um, this borders on arrogance. I dreamed the other night of how many people I've led to Jesus over 40-something years. I dreamed that. I dreamed about Bub and Randy leading me to Jesus. And how that all started back in there. And how all these, I was dreaming that. And I woke up and I said, you're so conceited. Don't you count them people. Amen. It, but, but it was funny because it, it was just in my dream. It was in my, so that's better to be dreaming about some of the stuff we dream about. Can I get an amen? So that was working. So God loves you. He wants to give you rest. He wants you to rest. Second, release your frustrations. How am I going to get past? Release your frustrations. This deals with the emotional side of the burnout. Don't complain to other people. Talk to God. Just say, God, this is the way I feel. Express your feelings. Pastor, listen, I've mowed grass more this week than I've done in a while. It's not because somebody else wouldn't mow grass. I needed to mow grass. I needed to ventilate. Y'all know what ventilation is? Without ventilation, amen, your house will burn up. 
I mean, it's too hot now. You've got to ventilate. Uh, my dog has a certain room he stays in. It's called the man cave. That's where Coda sleeps at night. Now we have to lift the windows just a little bit to ventilate the room. Because if you open the door, the ventilation, the, the, the smell of the dog comes through the house. I don't mind it. Wife does. Amen. So I shut the door, raise the windows, ventilate it back right outside. It's important to ventilate. And in your life, every now and then, you just need to ventilate. And some of you are so scared of God. Bless your heart. You're so afraid that you're going to say the wrong thing to God and he's going to be mad at you. I'm not talking about you cussing God. I'm talking about you telling God your issues, your problems. Look at it. When he went into the cave and spent the night, he said, God, he, God said, what you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous. I'm the man, Lord. Amen. What he says is, God, I've been living for you. I've been trying to do the right thing. I've been a good person. I've been following your plan for my life. But when he unloads in the next verse, God knew that Elijah in his burnout was a basket full of emotions. So he said, Elijah, go ahead and spill your guts. Blow off some steam. Tell me what you're really thinking. Tell me what you're really feeling. What's bugging you, dude? Hey, Amen. Go ahead and get it off your chest. And so he goes after it. Six things he says to God. He said, I'm afraid. I'm bitter. I'm angry. On top of that, I'm lonely. And on top of that, I'm worried. And on top of that, I'm depressed. He laid all that stuff out before God. When he, when he talked about being lonely, I think, well, you left your servant outside. You got to have your friends with you. Amen. But now you need to talk. You need to tell God. I talked to God this week about Johnny Clark dying. I talked to God this week about K.K. Brown dying. I talked to God this week because I don't have the answers. Amen. I talked to him about my own issues with my family. I talked to God about my wife's cancer. I talked to God about, uh, about David and Joseph and Josiah and about their lives and their future and what's going to happen in their lives. Amen. What are we going to do about this church here, the church over there? Do you know I got another call this week? Somebody wanted to buy this place? I said a high price. They ain't going for it. But if they ever do, y'all going to get a new church. It's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. But so I go, I go through these things in my head, but then I start ventilating. I just start telling God how I really feel. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. God says, go ahead. I'm not shocked with you, Elijah. Amen. You're my man. Verse 11. The Lord said, go out, stand in the mountains. All right, you got issues? Go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Now, I want you to imagine a wind so strong that it can snap rocks. We're not talking about an earthquake. Earthquake coming next. But this wind was so strong. This hurricane of a wind snapped rocks right in front of me. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Now, it didn't say that God didn't send it. It just said he wasn't in it. You follow me? He, he did it. He made it happen. The Lord wasn't in the earthquake. But after the earthquake came a fire. The Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Third point, how to overcome burnout, refocus. I know it's so simple to say, but it's so easy for us to lose. Refocus on God. Get your eyes off the problem and start looking back at Christ. Get a fresh awareness of God's power. See, that's what I believe camp was about. That's what I believe those revivals is about. I believe that's what about coming to church on Sundays is about. Yeah, to refocus it. It's the key. Go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, go, go. God said, Elijah, I want to get you along with me for just a little while. Amen. Why did God do the earthquake, the, the hurricane, amen, the wind and the firestorm? Then a small voice. I want to tell you why. Here's the answer. He was reminding Elijah of his power. Let me tell you something, son. I am in control. God. Because the root of all burnout is playing God. When you try to play God. Amen. When you decide you can make things happen. When you start playing God, then you start acting as if God doesn't matter. Like you have to make it all work. That you're in charge. You're in control. You're, you're setting yourself up for burnout. So here's what you got to do. You got to rest your body. Come, come on up, Joseph. You got to rest your body. See, we, we're in a place now in the third week of summer camp we got 140 showing up tomorrow and then we got another group coming next week we got 200 coming we got one break this summer the guys know i call it the deadliest catch 
Amen. It's like you're out on a boat and you don't get to come in until it's over with. Every day seemed like Groundhog's Day with a new broken pipe. Amen. Or something else that broke down. AC. We, got, we only have 36 air conditioners on the property. 36. I'll say it again. 36. And, and, that, and that's a guess. That's an approximation, but somewhere in that area. So I look back and I realize that as we move through this summer, as all the staff and the volunteers, and you as a church, and you work in your job in the heat at the plants, or you at home dealing with the kids, and all the things that are going on, you need to rest your body. You take a break. Ain't nothing wrong taking a break. You need to release your emotions. The reason I say tell God, God can handle it. If I told people my emotions, I could damage them. I could hurt them. Tell me how you really feel. Uh Uh-uh. I ain't telling you how I really feel. See, I got the ability to think it before I say it. I ain't got to say it. Because I told you, then we're going to have to go through a mending process if we're ever going to be friends again. See, I'm not going to say it. But I'm going to tell God all about it. Matter of fact, most of your names have become have come before God out of my mouth in a very kind way. Tell God. Speak to him. Release your emotions. Refocus on him. He's powerful enough. It's still about the vine and the branches. As long as I stay in him, things are going to be all right. And then this last step is so important. And this is what I, this morning on my way here, it hit me. God, I know so many people in this church that I've never seen really experience burnout. They've been tired, but they didn't experience burnout. And God said, yeah, that's because they rested. That's because they've learned how to release their anxieties back toward me. That's because they stay focused on me. And the fourth one, probably the most important one is get back to serving others. Get back to serving. Jesus taught us that it was the key, serving other people. See, what happens is that we think we're the only ones that are going through it. And we forget that other people are going through struggles. When my wife was going through cancer, amen, I, re- I walked in that room and I saw people all hooked up to chemo. I walked in the radiation place and saw people lined up for radiation. I realized, and I would remind her, you, you think you're going through something? Look at these people. Look what these folk are going through. Amen. Remind yourself. That way you don't fall into a pity. Amen. You start beating yourself. Stop thinking about your own self all the time. Start, start thinking about others who are less fortunate than you. I know when we're in pain, all we see is ourselves. If we look around, we'll find somebody who is more going through more than we are. So one of the ways of getting back out of burnout is to start giving your life away again. You only got one life. Start being a blessing to others. Because God never meant for you to come out of burnout so you, you could be selfish. A selfish little clod. It was never God's intentions. So God gave Elijah a new assignment. Let me wipe the sweat and I'll tell you what it is. God said, go back the way you came. When I, when I read the words, go back the way you came, it reminds me, go back to where you started. You know, in my life, it's not going back to Tuscumbia, Alabama. Go back to where it started. In other words, go back to when you repented. Go back to when you confessed me. Go go back and do your first works over. That's what he said in Revelation. I got one thing against you. Amen. You've lost your first love. Why did I lose my love? He said, well, go back and do your first works again. Prayer, witnessing, stay in the Word. Prayer, witnessing. Stay in the Word. That's what brought your zeal alive. And fourth one, serve other people. God said, go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, make him king over Aram. Then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, make him the king over Israel. Finally, anoint Elisha, son of Shepheth, amen, and this other dude, to succeed you as a prophet. In other words, he said, go back the way you came through the desert. And when you get there, anoint Haziel, Jehu, Watch this, and Elisha, you're going to do ministry with buddies now because you were never meant to do it alone. I'm going to give you an Elisha to hang out with you. See, we're never allowed to be alone. And then he said, go anoint Jehu. You know anything about Jehu? Do you know about Jehu, Joseph? You know about Jehu? 
Jehu, Jehu is a guy that drove his Dodge Charger furiously. Read it in your Bible. He drove his chariot furiously. He had a reputation for driving too fast. Jehu. Jehu, go anoint Jehu. Well, God, I, okay, I'll anoint Jehu and this calf, and, I, and I'll hang out with Elisha. Do you know what Jehu did? Jehu's the guy that drove up beside a castle, looked up there at Jezebel, and told her eunuchs, throw her down. <laughs> He's a bad cat, man. He said, throw that woman out of that. They threw her. <sighs> Mama Hicks, the Bible can be a little violent sometimes. The Scripture says they threw that woman out the window. This is the woman that says she's going to kill Elijah. So Elijah just goes and anoints a man who goes there and says, throw that wicked woman down. See, Jezebel has to do everything with manipulation. She's a manipulator. She's a witch. A spirit can move through life. Manipulation. They threw her down. You know what happened? The dogs ate her. They ate everything but her hands and her face. Everything but her hands and her face. Now, I, I'm not basically a Pentecostal person. But I have actually heard Pentecostal preachers say, the reason they didn't eat their hands and face is because she used her hands to put her makeup on. That makeup is evil stuff. I don't know nothing about that. All I know, if the barn needs paint and paint it, can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. So God, God has this recovery. He doesn't want you to be alone. He wants you to have an anointing, to have favor, to be a blessing to somebody else. So he brings Elisha in. Boy, that's another sermon there. So first, get your physical act together. Maybe you need to rearrange your schedule so that you can get some rest. You've been trying to burn the candle. I heard it for years. Pastor, you burn the candle at both ends. I quit years ago. My vocabulary shifted. I quit saying I'm busy. started saying I'm effective. The things I can't get done, I realize that, so I don't even try to be try to do it. I just want to get done what I need to get done. Then you do the emotional, you unplug. Take a walk. Maybe not 40 days, but take a walk. Amen. Give yourself a little time. When you do that, talk, ventilate. Tell God how you really feel. See, some of you think that prayer is some type of holy moment. Sometimes prayer is pretty messy. Sometimes prayer is telling God how you really feel. Amen. Maybe it's telling God that you thought this is the way he wanted you to do it, and God said, I never said that. You know, see, Elisha, when, he, when Elijah went there, God said, what are you doing here? God never told Elijah to go there. He did it on his own. <laughs> He's doing his own thing. But he forgot the power of God and the miracles in his life. You guys have had miracles. Steve, Jamie, I was there. When Bryce was a baby, y'all thought y'all were going to lose him. Bryce, you just a little thing. I walked in and left a bandana over your cradle. I seen miracles, man. And if you forget those miracles, you'll fall into a depression like Elijah did. Amen. God been good to us. Can I get an amen? Amen. Refocus the center of your life around Jesus. Get your eyes. Then you get involved in helping somebody else. That's why I feel like God gave us that camp. That's why when you guys are mowing grass here, you and James and the rest of you guys, take care of this property. Mike Key, when you come in here, take care of a wall. Man, you may not hear it from me enough, but there's an appreciation come out of heaven. Amen. You're doing what we, we can't all get to. This has been a challenge to pastor two churches. It's been a challenge for all of us, but it's been worth it. It's been some of the better years of my life. Amen. Getting to do what we do. And I thank God for that 110 acres out there right now because right now it gives us all something. We got something we can go do. We got a place we can stretch out. We got a real both. Amen. We can, we can stretch out. Nobody's quarreling over it or fighting over it. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I speak to this body today and I tell them to rest. Don't you burn out. You may be tired. Get some rest. Release your emotions. I don't care if you've got to slap a pillow, put on some gloves, and go punch a refrigerator. 
I don't care if you've got to go mow grass. Somehow, release your emotions. Refocus back on God. Amen. Be careful what you're watching, what you're hearing. Get back, focus on Him. And then begin to serve others again. Pastor, would you believe this works? I know it through personal experience. This works. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Pray for me, because i got to do this again. I know y'all say, well, you always do it. it. It doesn't make it easier. Sometimes it's here, you know, I think, and that's it. But you go and you got to say it again, and it always turns out different. So if you show up out there, it would be like a different message, Mandy. <laughs> Just another message. This week, my daughter turned. I had one daughter turn 30, another one turned 32. You know what that means, don't you? Uh-huh, that's none of your business. That just means my daughters are middle-aged. That's all that means. <laughs> Amen. If you need to tie their offering envelope, would you mind lifting your hand? Our servant leaders are coming up here right now to get an envelope. For, oh, no, no, no. You've got an envelope right in front of you. you got an envelope right in front of you. Reach down there and get that envelope. You do not stop giving your tithe and the blessing of your offering because gas is going up. Again, this is when the water pours over the sacrifice. Amen. Because when that sacrifice takes place, that's when God says, okay, I know I can trust that person. See, it's about him trusting us. It's so important. So honor God with your giving. Never let that stop. Always be a blessing to the house. Again, appreciate all you're doing. You give Pastor David a hand as he comes. Amen. Come on up here.